And thank you all for hanging out to the end. And I really appreciate all these great talks. It's been a real pleasure uh, to sit here and listen to science. The last two months, I was at Amazon um, working on products. And so it's great to just sit back and think about science for a change. And what I'd like to do today is to uh, take you through a little bit of the history of human motion estimation, why I think it's important. And this will be a little bit of a personal view of the history. These are the, I'll tell you about the papers that I thought influenced, that influenced me and that I feel uh, caused some phase transition in the field or really influenced the field. So for people who are interested in this area, this will be um, sort of an introduction. And I will make the slides available with a detailed uh, bibliography so people can um, go find out the recent literature. Uh, and then I'll also go into some of our recent work, and hopefully uh, that may inspire some of you uh, to think about this problem. The, the work I'll talk about today <laughs> goes back to um, uh, my own work on this, back to around 1993. I will not, uh, this is not all the people I've worked with, this is just the last three or four years of the Perceiving Systems Department, my group at Max Planck, uh, and it's a wonderful set of people, and I will cite everybody as we go along, so, um, Hopefully, I don't leave anybody out. If I forget a major piece of work, did I leave you out, Honorak? Uh, no, who are the body models? <laughs> <laughs> who is this one? The espresso machine? <laughs> oh, there is, there's maybe a, you'll find out later. There's some uh, extra people in here. Um, and one, <laughs> one very, very important dog, one of the most important <laughs> members of the department. These are probably the two most important members of the department, um, the espresso machine and Rocco. They keep us uh, both energized and calm at the same time during deadlines. So anyway, what, uh, what I'm interested in, though, is people. I've always been interested in people. And I think computers are not going to be really full partners with us until they understand us um, like we understand each other. And uh, by understanding people, um, I don't mean like uh, traditional action recognition, like classifying jumping jacks or so on. I, I mean something a little more subtle. I, these are the kinds of images I'm thinking about. And, and for example, in this lower left image, I could ask you, uh, you know, questions about it. Do these people know each other? Are they friendly? Are they flirting? Um, are they interested in dating? Are they already dating? I don't know. You might be able to answer some of these questions. I'm also interested in contact, our interactions with each other. Uh, are incredibly significant. Um, in the upper left, is that guy trying to kill the woman? Probably not. <laughs> they probably like each other, and they're really happy to see each other. Um, you can infer that from that picture. Uh, these two guys down here, um, they may not like each other so much. Uh, whether you can infer that from the picture or not, I don't know. Um, and then we, of course, interact with objects to manipulate the world. We're constantly in contact with the world. Um, I'm in contact with the ground right now. It's what supports me. I'm in contact with um, tools that I use to manipulate my environment. And so we're constantly interacting uh, with the world. And sometimes we interact with each other through the world in collaborative activities. So I'm interested in all of these kinds of things and trying to get computers to understand uh, what's going on in images or videos. I'm not showing you videos here. So the goal is sort of two parts, and I see them as interrelated, uh, to train computers to see us, understand our behaviors, emotions, our actions, to understand our interactions with each other and the world around us, and to under, inter, um, understand our interactions with computers and robots, for example. And there's a second part which I'll talk a little bit less about today, um, which is kind of the graphic side of this. My belief is if we can create avatars that are fully realistic, that you cannot distinguish their behavior, say, in a virtual environment from the behavior of a human in that environment or a group of humans, then in some sense we have modeled and understood something fundamental about human behavior. That's where we'd eventually like to get to. There's inter the reasons to do this in an interrelated way. If we're good at the first one, it helps us to train the second one. If we're good at the second one, it provides fantastic training data for the first one. And we tend to do both of these things in my department together. So why is it a hard problem? Well, uh, we're very high dimensional. Um, we can uh, move our body into all kinds of poses. Uh, we occlude ourselves uh, we, because we're complicated and articulated. Um, there's this fundamental problem of projecting a complicated 3D thing into the 2D image. You lose a dimension and you have to recover that if you want to reason about the three-dimensional pose of bodies. And we can just, you know, we come in all sorts of different sizes and we cover ourselves in clothing. We stick our heads in canoes or kayaks and 
Um, we appear in unusual poses like this and in crowds and so on. Um, and, and so it's a, uh, it's a challenging thing to understand human shape and, and pose as well as behavior. So I want to start with a little history of um, the field. And where does the history of the field start? It starts with the history of photography, in the beginning of photography. The very first, uh, some of the very first uses of photography were by people like Mybridge and Marais to understand human and animal motion. Um, uh, and uh, so Mybridge did these famous studies on uh, human motion, uh, doing multi-camera capture, by the way, actually uh, vaguely synchronized multi-camera capture systems. It was quite interesting, but he didn't have any computer, <laughs> computers or anything, so he couldn't do anything with it. Um, Marais, though, set the sort of foundations of a lot of the field by, by saying, well, look, you know, uh, let's get a little more uh, quantitative about this and put some reflective dots on people such that we can uh, figure out something about, uh, we can track it post hoc. So here's a timed exposure of a person walking down an incline, and we can see this uh, reflective dot on their head um, oscillating in some way, and this gives you some sort of signature of the motion. This idea has been very powerful, and today um, every commercial uh, special effects movie uses motion capture equipment, which um, is sort of the, the, you know, the antecedent of this um, uh, idea. So, uh, but let me, let me jump ahead to 1973 and this notion of, of dots and uh, tracking the motion of dots. This work by... Um, Johansson, I think, is one of the most influential pieces of work in, in the field of human motion, the human motion understanding, because it's so powerful and so simple. We see uh, 10 or 12 dots. Here they correspond to the major joints of the body. And we see them in motion. And we can't help but have a percept here of a walking person. And Johansson uh, hypothesized that with just as few as of these 10 or 12 elements, um, uh, that this could invoke in motion a compelling impression of human walking, dancing, etc. And for the last um, however many years, since 40 years, uh, people have basically been uh, chasing this idea. And I'm always a little skeptical when I see etc. in a paper. Um, it can either mean uh, and everything else, or those are the things I could test and tried, and those sort of worked, and I'm not sure about the rest. And I think that the truth here is somewhat in between. Um, this is not, I'm, I hope to convince you by the end of today, that this is not all that's necessary. This is, nece this is sufficient to evoke walking here and dancing and running, but there's going to be many activities where this kind of representation of the body is insufficient. Anyway, it's... Uh, it's influenced the field dramatically, as you'll see, because there's a lot of work on detecting these joints. So also in 73, interesting how things come this way, uh, Fischler and Erschlager uh, proposed, I think, the first real model of uh, how one might recognize something about the human body. And it was this very influential model of pictorial structures. And the idea is that you might be able to detect things like eyes and hair and mouth and nose and so on, these basic parts, and then those things would be connected together and organized into a whole through some sort of a network-like structure. So you're going to detect the parts and then integrate them into a, a, a face in this case. And uh, only three years later, Jeff Hinton wrote his very first paper, which almost nobody has read. Uh, Hinton didn't even have a copy of it, but I managed to get one. Um, and, uh, and this paper was on, on be seeing a puppet. So what's a puppet? It's a collection of, of, um, uh, of rectangles in this case. You know, the, the, there's no image, because you couldn't get images into a computer in 1976. Uh, but he had this collection of rectangles. And then the question was, does that collection of rectangles represent a person? Or he called it a puppet. Um, and uh, the way he approached that was, again, through a network. All of the parts were connected to each other in, in some sort of spring-like system. Uh, it was called relaxation labeling at the time. It later became belief propagation when it became probabilistic. Uh, but um, 
uh, in this paper, he said the lo th he was aware already of the problem that you could detect local parts, but then there would be ambiguities about how these were integrated into a whole. And he wrote the local ambiguities have to be resolved by finding the best global interpretation. And for this simple problem, relaxation labeling, which was the thing of the time, it was the deep ne network of the day, um, enabled you to solve this in a globally optimal way. I'm happy to give people a copy of the paper if they're interested. Uh, We'll see Hinton again later, by the way. So this wasn't the end of Hinton's interest in the body. Um, also in 1973, uh, there was a group at Stanford headed by Tom Binford. And Ram Navacha, who's a well-known computer vision researcher, was a PhD student then. And they were working on a 3D representation already of the body. And how did you get 3D data into the computer? Well, they first had to build a 3D capture system. So in 1973, they took lasers and projected them on dolls like this and found these lines and found the curvature and able, were re able to reconstruct 3D, uh, get 3D data into the computer, which they then fit with generalized cylinders and came up with a representation of the body, which I think was just a remarkable technical feat. Imagine you started doing computer vision today and you had to build your own camera. Uh, they, they achieved just a tremendous amount. Mar Nishihara then formalized this idea like, what is a human body? It can, you know, or in this case, um, animals in general. The idea was that there could be a very generic, general compositional structure with reusable parts. So we can approximate a human by a bunch of cylinders or an ape by a bunch of cylinders. And what distinguishes them are the, 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 the size and shape of these cylinders or the number of cylinders and how they're arranged. And you can take cylinders and make a horse or a hippopotamus. And, and it, this was a very powerful general theory that the world is compositional in some fundamental sense. And that if we could pull these basic parts out of an image, that would be much simpler than trying to recognize all the animals in the world. We just have to recognize things like cylinders. And then we do what Hinton did, build a network that sews all the cylinders together into something. And oh, and then we'd have to recognize it. But people didn't really pay attention to that So uh, yet. People should stop me, by the way, uh, if you have any questions. Um, so then it took a while. Uh, we had to wait almost a decade after these first 70 things in 73 for somebody to have images in a computer and, and provide the very first solution to uh, fitting a 3D model to image evidence. And this was David Hogg's program to see a walking person. And he found edges in an image using standard edge detection techniques of the day and then fit a 3D model to this. And it was kind of, you could think of this as an early version of bottom-up. So I detect a bunch of low-level features. OK, they're not cylinders or shape primitives, but they're some edges in the image. And then I fit a model, a very powerful model of what a human is, top-down to this bottom-up information. Now, this, <laughs> I just put, put this here just as a historical note. In the paper, he thanks uh, Hans Helmut Nagel, who uh, was a prominent um, uh, computer vision person in Germany. And he thanked him for just getting this image into the computer. Like, how did you get, in 1983, to get an image, in, a sequence of images into a computer was a real feat. And I have to thank Andrew Fitzgibbon, who managed to take those images out of the paper and turn them into a video, which wasn't really possible at the time either. So this is Hogg's result uh, shown as a video with the model projected onto the image. Now, you might wonder, what did the code look like? What, was it a deep neural network? No, it was this. It was a, a whole lot of very, um, intricately hand-coded rules about the locations of things and how parts related to each other. It was just remarkably detailed. Uh, but he had this, this, the basic idea of a kinematic tree of the body represented by these parts or cylinders. Um, and then he tried to fit this. Uh, and then no one could reproduce it. So that's what I call the lost decade. Hogg showed this working on this one sequence, and everybody sort of thought, well, that's cool, and then nothing. Uh, basically, really, 10 years went by, and there wasn't another paper of any significance on this problem. And uh, I think he just scared them off, right? It was just uh, too hard, and uh, his solution was too brittle, and we didn't have the techniques in place. So uh, I came into this around 93, and right around then, the, the basic paradigm 
that got followed for many years afterwards emerged, motivated by Mara Nishihara, the idea that you would have a uh, uh, sort of a, a model of the body represented by some geometric primitive cylinders or something else. Um, uh, it would have some parameters, say a, a torso that could translate and rotate in some world coordinate system, and then parts that would rotate relative to that in a, in a kinematic tree. Okay, so the the upper arm rotates relative to the torso, and the lower arm relate, rotates relative to the upper arm. Um, and then what one's goal is, is to find these parameters, these uh, pose parameters theta, that give me a, a, a pose of the body, such that when I project it into the image, I have to know something about the camera as well, of course, that uh, the projection somehow matches, in some sense, features that I might find in the images. And we might do this in one image or a set of synchronized images. So this idea um, uh, sort of generalized both Mar Nishihara and Hogg, and then pe papers started to come out. So uh, here, this is just an example, um, one that I really influenced me at the time because it seemed to actually work, where they could find edges in the image and project these models in. And then Nagel himself was working on this problem. Um, in related work, so this was during the lost decade, so I said it's not entirely lost decade. This work from Sandy Pentland's group, um, uh, they were fitting, instead of uh, cylinders, they were fitting these um, uh, superquadrics. Uh, these were non-rigid parts. It was also super brittle, um, and notice how they, they did it on a tin man. Um, they actually should have used cylinders because they actually fit the tin man better. So it was sort of exactly the wrong um, data set to work on. But uh, anyway, uh, and then the very first multi-camera setup was from this guy, Dario Gavrilla, who was a student of Larry Davis's at the University of Maryland. He, he set up a multi-camera uh, system. People had to wear colorful um, Harlequin outfits, so every part of their body was a different color. But then he built these, these superquadric models that matched the people and then uh, was able to fit them in a, this geodesic dome thing. This, this really predicted much of what was going to happen for the next decade or more, maybe two decades. At that time, I became interested in faces and then bodies. And um, I was interested in how things moved. And most of this work, well, up until then, all of this work was focused on estimating the pose of a body in a single image. And I thought, well, why not let's, let's try to represent the motion of a body over time, and then we can use a video sequence. And then estimating human motion is basically the same as estimating the optical flow in an image sequence, but just with a very fancy parameterized model, where the parameterized model happens to have some body parts and some articulation and so on. And if we could optimize over that space of articulations, and it, in this case, we didn't have to project it into the image because it was a 2D model. Uh, we could estimate the, the motion of a, a person. Because it was a 2D model, we could only do half the body. We couldn't deal with occlusion. This was um, uh, problematic. But a couple years later, Chris Bregler and Jatendra Malik came out with some very nice work that took that idea and pushed it into 3D. So their idea was, well, don't do this in 2D. Do this cylinder-like thing of Mara Nishihara, project it into the 2D image, and have that define the, the motion or optical flow across the sequence. And so their, their optimization function was to minimize the brightness error between pixels at every frame, uh, given the motion that was um, uh, the motion of the body according to the parameters you're estimating. So projected 2D motion in the image. That worked pretty well. So, so far, this is all very handcrafted. Everything is built by hand, very carefully set up to optimize. Um, but already in 1996, we had the first learned model of the human body. So, uh, okay, it maybe doesn't really look like a human body, uh, but Bomberg and Hogg had this very clever idea, which is they took uh, pedestrians walking, they segmented the images into foreground and background, and then they defined the, low, the most lower left um, part of the, of, of the silhouette, as uh, position zero, and then they took a contour around that with a fixed number of points, um, evenly spaced, and then they did principal component analysis on a whole lot of those contours, and they got these ghostly human-like figures. Um, this is showing modes of these principal components varying, and you can see this is kind of like 
I don't know, legs walking or something like that. But with enough of these eigen shapes, they were able to fit uh, contours in the image, and then they showed an application where they could estimate the direction or heading of motion of a person. And uh, this worked for people wearing backpacks and all kinds of things. So it was the first, I think really the first use of machine learning, though you might think of it as rather primitive today, um, in, uh, in this field. Any questions so far? All right, so this was all um, incredibly brittle and incredibly hard to optimize. Uh, you had to initialize on the true solution and hope you didn't diverge from it and it only run on one image sequence and the whole thing was pretty terrible. Um, and so uh, uh, several people around this time started to think about the idea of doing some kind of stochastic search to make this more robust. Um, the first really nice work was from um, work done in Andrew Blake's group when he was still at Oxford. And they used simulated annealing. Um, around the same time, Cham and Ray came up with a slightly hacky um, particle-based method for doing this in 2D. And then Hedvig Sidenblad and, and I were, were um, inspired by particle filtering, which was a brand new idea um, in the computer vision field, at least, and uh, represented a distribution over the 3D poses of a body and then optimized um, that over time, maintaining uncertainty, which allowed you to be much more robust uh, during tracking than previous methods. So the idea was to have a, a distribution and propagate it over time, and, uh, and then here I'm showing a map estimate at every time instant, and uh, it was also kind of brittle, quite honestly. Um, and the problem was our image evidence was just terrible. Um, if you didn't have a strong prior, none of these things worked. So um, what kind of priors? So what, what was the point of a prior? So we were all very Bayesian at the time. We had some likelihood which involved maybe matching edges or optical flow in my case. Um, and, and then we, it, nothing worked. So we said, okay, well, I know it's walking. Let me have a strong prior that says, uh, what does walking look like? And then that will super constrain the state space and I'll be able to solve this thing. So Hedvig and I proposed uh, the first one of these priors, which was based again on principal component analysis, which was the machine learning tool of the day. Uh, and so we took motion capture data of people walking, we subtracted the mean, we did principal component, uh, principal component analysis, and here are the first four principal components of walking motions. Uh, we had to deal with all kinds of things that you know, are irrelevant today. Uh, but then we were able to use this quite effectively in tracking walking people, but nothing else. Um, uh, Raquel, uh, who spoke earlier in this meeting, she, um, her first claim to fame was doing, taking these ideas and, and making them a bit more powerful by extending them with the next machine learning tool of the day, which is Gaussian process latent variable models. And uh, again, she did this for a variety of different kinds of activities. Each activity, whether it was walking or a golf swing, was learned independently um, and then optimized independently. Um, but these things kind of worked. And then Hinton comes back into the picture in 2007 with the first uh, deep learning approach to representing human motion with a restricted Boltzmann machine. This was pretty cool because you could also sample from this model and generate uh, synthetic walkers, which was a really neat thing. Um, but here's the problem with priors. Um, I turned off the likelihood term here. Uh, we initialize with the right answer, and uh, if you have a strong prior and it's a walking prior, you're only going to get walking. So if she happened to be walking straight across the image, this result would look great, um, except she unfortunately turns, and oh, it just keeps... What's that? Is it Hedwig? It's Hedwig, yeah. Ah. Um, this, is a, this, yeah. <laughs> this is at Xerox back in the old days. Uh, so I, after this, um, I started to really feel that priors are a crutch for the weak. Um, you need them when you don't know how to solve the problem. If you knew how to solve the problem, if you could just, um, you, you know, uh, then, and that is you could extract the information from the image, you wouldn't have to constantly be hypothesizing the world with some fantasy prior. The image contains so much information that we just weren't getting out of it. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll see where that leads us in a second. But uh, at right around that time, um, 
uh, the, the graphical models, if you go back to Fischler and Erschlager, Schlanger, um, they started to come back, these pictorial structures models. And these things actually started to work uh, well. You say so you had, this is very much like Hinton, notice the boxes, right? Bottom up, you would detect a bunch of parts, and then you would have a graphical model that would do some kind of inference to put them all together. And uh, uh, the sort of earliest work of that was both this Felsenswalb and Huttenlocker and then the Ramanon and Forsyth work from Berkeley. Um, this was all in the, the, our, our tool of the day, of course, was graphical models. Um, and both of these things started to kind of work, uh, which was exciting. And various people improved upon this, including Stefan. A lot of work building on this. In our own work, we were still interested in 3D, so we pushed this graphical model in the, in the direction of uh, a 3D parts instead of 2D parts. And then everything got much, much harder because now we had to do inference in a much higher dimensional space. So this, the, we did, uh, um, so we had this pictorial structures model of 3D parts. Uh, we would only get 2D uh, information bottom up uh, and then we try to infer the 3D pose uh, through this complicated message passing thing with particles. The whole thing was horribly complicated and painful. Um, uh, but the basic idea was as follows. You got a bunch of part detections, including a bunch of random ones. Um, uh, this is the initial, these are all your particles. Uh, these are the, the most likely fits at a given iteration. This thing would pass messages around, building up confidence in certain kinds of locations of these parts. Uh, and then after a few iterations, it would begin to converge if you were lucky on uh, highly probable locations of all the parts in the image. A lot of times you weren't very lucky. And so I was really getting a little dismayed about this, um, that we were making so little progress and that we had to be so reliant on priors so, you know, I thought that the whole idea, like, I have to know it's walking before I even estimate walking was kind of lame. And, um, and I really thought the problem was this, that we don't know what people look like. How are we going to exploit rich image evidence if our models of the human body look like Hogg's uh, cylinder person, right? And that I really felt that these things were making uh, the word world brittle, and we needed better models of the human body. Now, people had tried to do that. Uh, you remember Gavrilla had this thing uh, with superquadrix. Schmincinescu had something similar, same with Metaxas. Um, Plonkers and Fua came up with this elaborate metaballs thing that um, uh, was the closest thing to looking like a human body, but was very hard to, to reason about and optimize with. Uh, and then a miracle occurred. Um, uh, and it was this paper from SIGGRAPH in, in uh, uh, 1999, a morphable model for the synthesis of 3D faces. This was done in Tübingen when these guys were in Heinrich Bultoff's group, and they built this uh, model of faces. And what did they do? They took a, a 3D scanner, and they scanned several hundred graduate students and other people, um, and uh, Cyberware made this thing in 1989. Uh, people made the first scan of a 3D body. But the cool thing about this cyberware scanner is they captured the 3D shape of faces and the appearance. And then they learned, using principal component analysis, uh, a very simple deformable model of how face shape varied and how appearance could vary. And then they fit this to images. So this was just absolutely stunning result for, it's still actually pretty darn good result, for 1999. Um, uh, given an image like this, you want to F optimize over the shape space of uh, 3D uh, face shapes and the appearance space such that um, it matches the image in, uh, as, uh, as well as possible. They also optimized over lighting. It was very, very complicated optimization. People had trouble reproducing these results, but it, um, it really uh, changed the way people thought. So let's just do that for bodies. Wouldn't that be great? Um, it turns out bodies are a lot harder. So why are we harder? Well, the face is obviously part of the body, so we're at least as hard as the face. Uh, in addition to that, the, the body has about 600 muscles, about 200 bones, a couple hundred joints, um, many different types of joints. We're also highly non-rigid and deformable, and our shape varies uh, even throughout the day. So. Um, this makes the problem of modeling the body hard, 
And uh, fortunately, with the advent of these scanners, uh, we could begin to tackle this problem. And, and a major uh, change in the field happened in, a, in 2001 with the release of the CSER data set. CSER was something done by the U.S. Army where they got a sampling of the U.S. population according to the census in like 99 or something. And so they had people of all kinds of weights and ages. They were adults, like 18 to 75 or so in, in age. Uh, and they put them in some tight-fitting clothing and they had them stand in roughly this, the same pose. And they got this three-dimensional scans of their body. And so people got excited about that. In 2003, there was the first um, 3D body model. And this is actually the a second version of their model from 2006. Uh, and you can see that uh, they can control things like the shape of the body a little bit, but there's something not quite right here. Right? The shoulders look wrong and um, the proportions are all kind of crazy and the elbows are doing something horrible. Um, so, but this, was, this pointed the way. And, and there's been tons of work since trying to learn these 3D body models. Like in, in 2010, this was work by Nils Hasler and his colleagues at the MPI for Informatic. Uh, and they also tried to represent changes in body shape and changes in pose. They, the body has a bunch of bones in this case, and to represent shape, they just added a bunch of more bones, like random shape bones, and controlled those, and it, it didn't really look very, um, very realistic. Uh, the, and, and so it was actually this model that caught my attention in 2005, the, the scape model by Drago Angolov and... Um, Sebastian Thrun and others at Stanford. And uh, they had a fairly small data set of 3D scans, of, but they had people in both different poses and with different shapes. And they had uh, a really beautiful approach to um, f represent a factored, and I'll tell you what I mean by factored in just a minute, a model of body shape. And it looked pretty, pretty good and pretty realistic. And I thought, aha, this is it. This is what we've been needing to solve this problem all along. And so we very quickly re-implemented it, um, which wasn't as easy as uh, we thought, uh, of course. Um, uh, and then the first paper that used this model in computer vision came out in uh, 2007. And so here we, had, we were fitting to multi-camera silhouette data. Uh, this is a silhouette of my wife. Um, and this is not how she looks. But she doesn't look like this either. <laughs> I guess she looked more like this than this. The whole idea was this is what we were fitting to these images before. Um, and this overlap is the yellow region. Uh, this is what we were fitting. And you can see that uh, a parameterized model of the body where we could estimate something about both the pose and the shape fits the image evidence much better. And so we could show that this was a more robust uh, solution than this cylinder thing we'd been using. So it felt like we were moving in, in the right direction. Any questions? Yeah. And when it comes to, you mentioned robust, does it mean by the parameter space or the optimization problem is easier to solve or is it just more realistic? Uh, I mean, in this case, um, fails less. Um, so it's because of the better geometry? The better geometry fits the, fits the image evidence better, so it's less ambiguous. I mean, it's a very ambiguous problem going from the 2D to the 3D, so you have, uh, you've reduced some of the ambiguity, I think. There are fewer ways to make mistakes. Other questions? All right, so that's, um, that's set me on a course uh, that we've been on ever since to, towards building virtual humans and um, trying to make them more and more realistic. And so here are some examples of virtual humans. The idea is to define a very simple mathematical model of the body that looks like a real person, moves like a real person, deforms like a real person, but is really low dimensional, differentiable, um, and easy to fit to data or to animate. And uh, so this is just uh, some textured models. How did we do that? Um, well, we realized we needed to get a uh, uh, a lot more information about people. So we built this four-dimensional scanner. It has 66 cameras, uh, 44 stereo cameras, and 22 color cameras, and capturing at 60 frames a second. Uh, and what it captures is a full three-dimensional mesh of the body at um, 60 times a second. And so that pink thing is a, is a mesh, and you can see it's kind of noisy, but it also captures lots of soft tissue details, um, how the muscle uh, deforms, how the body fat uh, ripples and uh, waves propagate through it, and so on. 
And you could, and we, she's doing jumping jacks at, on purpose so that you can see that we can capture the full range of human motion uh, in this scanning system. So for the first time, we could really get uh, detailed information about the human body. And, and so we took this approach of collecting, and there were already existing data. We, of course, we used Caesar and, and a lot of other data, um, thousands of people with varying body shapes and then thousands of poses um, of all kinds of people, of all kinds of different ages. Uh, when I show pictures of people jumping around and stuff in tight-fitting clothing, by the way, those are all professional models um, who signed uh, modeling contracts. They're in addition to human subjects. We have a lot of human subjects as well. I tend not to show the human subjects unless it's like me or something. Um, uh, but these are all professional models, like these ones here. Um, and so then the idea was to somehow take thousands of these scans and, and learn some function M. M produces a mesh, and it takes as input uh, the same kinematic tree structure I told you before, the pose of the body theta. There's going to be some parameters beta, um, maybe something about dynamics I'm not going to talk about in this talk, maybe something about appearance I'm not going to talk about in this talk, um, and then produces a mesh uh, that looks like the one below. All right. So uh, since most of you are probably not familiar with 3D meshes and computer graphics and all this stuff, I'll just walk you through what this is all about. So we represent the body using a triangulated mesh that looks like this. It has a, a very nice uh, topology, how the vertices are laid out. This is very important for graphics people. Um, and uh, it's segmented um, into parts, some number of parts. It's decided a priori the number of parts and roughly where they are. We're going to optimize the segmentation, but um, uh, you can see them sort of color-coded here. The mesh has about 7,000 vertices. These are 3D points. So that is a mesh is 21,000 numbers. That's a body to me. Uh, now, of course, most settings of these 21,000 numbers don't correspond to people or anything else, right? So the, the whole trick here is always going to be to somehow uh, uh, characterize which settings of those 21,000 numbers actually correspond to uh, real people. And um, uh, it's fairly high dimensional, it's pretty complex, and we're not going to have all that much data. So we're going to appeal to the idea that uh, Angulov had in his thesis, which is to factorize this. Um, now there's pros and cons to this, but we're going to factor body shape into a bunch of different causes. One of them is going to be shape or identity. So what you see here is uh, 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 cycling through a shape space of body shapes of, of women um, in which you should see the pose should be constant. It should look constant to you, but the shape should be varying. Only identity should be varying. We're going to have a pose space where only the pose is varying, and she should, this should look like the same woman all the time, even though she's deforming and, and so on. And it should look real, like her shoulders should do the right thing, and um, her elbows should look real, and so on. And then we should be able to compose these two things, pose and shape, to represent any person's body shape in any uh, valid human pose. So here we're changing them both at the same time. This is really going to simplify learning and inference. Uh, it's not perfect, um, and there's ways to fix it, but it's going to be good enough for now. Uh, that's not the only way we deform. There's all kinds of other ways we deform. We deform with breathing, and we've worked on that problem. We deform with, um, with uh, dynamic motions. That is, we have all this soft tissue motion going on. I'm not going to talk about that today, but we also model that. So a bunch of underlying causes for our shape at any given moment in time. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so I made it sound easier than it is. Uh, these scans we get are not really ready to be used. So the scans come in. Every scan is just a unique point cloud with a different number of points in some random order. Uh, there miss there's missing data, like holes in the feet here and up here. There's noise. And, and really, to make this useful, I have to put all of these meshes, that I, these point clouds, into correspondence. So a big part of what um, we had to do in the early days was learn how to do this, solve this problem. So given an arbitrary scan in blue here, and it's some arbitrary pose uh, with noise, and you can see some missing data here, uh, we want to take a generic template mesh, this uh, body that we have in T, and repose it and deform it in such a way that it looks like the scan. So you can maybe see that the pink thing 
uh, it becomes, uh, takes on the pose and shape of the scan, but is lower resolution. But the fit between them is quite tight, and this, this guy looks like this guy, or he should, given the resolution of the mesh. So this is a process where we, um, one of those things, uh, you read a SIGGRAPH paper, they've solved this problem, you think, okay, great, we'll implement that, and then it doesn't work. Um, and then you realize, oh, wait a second, it's, um, they had to do all this stuff by hand in the SIGGRAPH paper to make it work. And we wanted to scale this up to thousands or hundreds of thousands of scans. We couldn't do things manually. So we built a, something we called co-registration that effectively uh, simultaneously solves for uh, a model of the body and the alignment of that model uh, to, the, um, to the meshes. And if you do this sort of together, uh, you get better results. So anyway, uh, this was a, a big pain. <laughs> it was the least, um, I don't know, we got like one publication out of many years of work for that, but it was absolutely necessary to do everything else. So the, the data coming in here, you see very highly detailed, but it's just point clouds. Um, and uh, these point clouds need to be put in correspondence. And, and we have now, you know, uh, 60 frames a second, so it's an awful lot of data. So this, uh, we extended this alignment technique across time, and we call that forecap. And what you should see here is the mesh on the body uh, looks like it's kind of glued on there, or it should. The projector is not great. Um, and uh, now these things are in correspondence across time. So now we have thousands or hundreds of thousands of 3D meshes of people uh, where they're in, we have the different shapes, the different poses, and everybody's in correspondence. So now we can begin to do some statistics or some learning on this. Um, so the first thing we did, taking this factored approach, is to focus on body shape. And given that we have a model of the body already, this presupposes we have a model of the body, we can repose everybody into a neutral pose. This is really important um, because the big nonlinearities in representing human shape all come from pose. I mean, by rotating my, my arm, that's nonlinear to begin with. So if we get rid of all those nonlinearities, we have a very simple problem to learn. We have to learn shape. And shape, if you took uh, your, probably your first class on probability, they showed you a bell curve. And that bell curve was probably of heights in the population. So uh, height has this sort of normal distribution to it. Of course, it's not normal because the tails are not um, infinite. Uh, but bodies grow in a fairly natural sort of way. And so one thing we can do is take all of those thousands of people and now compute the average shape in the population. So this is the average man and the average woman in the U.S. and Europe, circa 2000. Uh, and uh, now we have a whole bunch of these examples. Remember, each of them is 21,000 numbers. Uh, but we're only going to have a couple thousand bodies. So what's the best way to learn a model um, uh, where you need to represent 21,000 numbers and you only got 2,000 bodies, and the data is roughly linear and Gaussian? Well, PCA is your friend, uh, so that's what we do. We subtract the mean shape from each of these uh, bodies, uh, put it in a mesh, do principal component analysis on this, and then you have a very simple linear subspace describing the shape of, uh, of bodies. This is, uh, and so what, how do I represent a body then? Uh, a body, which is some function uh, of some parameters beta. These parameters are, are the linear coefficients of the PCA model. Uh, we have a mean, we have a basis U, which is the low dimensional um, principal components, uh, times these linear coefficients, and that gives us an approximation to any body shape. And typically we use on the order of 10 to 50 such um, principal components to represent human shape. Really simple. So what do those principal components look like? Well, kind of what you would think. The first one looks like you know, height, and the second one looks like weight, and then there's various other kinds of body proportions, arm length, hip to whatever. It's, they don't make any sense necessarily, uh, but they're capturing. These are showing you the um, primary directions of variation in the, in the male and female population, uh, just varying the principal components along plus or minus three standard deviations uh, from the mean. Any questions? Yeah. In the previous uh, for the skin model, it seems like a triangular mesh. Yeah. Here is a uh, mesh. Yeah. Is that yeah. So we uh, we start with a quad mesh because artists like that, and then we triangulate it. 
Um, the big difference between scape and what I'm going to show you here is scape worked on triangle deformations. So for each triangle in the, in the mesh, they had nine degrees of freedom to represent how it got deformed from, say, a base mesh to some other mesh. Um, that's over-parameterized, so it's a lot of parameters, and some of them are actually unnecessary. That causes all kinds of problems when you're trying to learn a model. Uh, the other thing is each triangle in the scape model is deformed independently. So um, you learn a, a model of how they all deform. Uh, you take your base mesh, you deform all the triangles. Now they're just in kind of a soup of deformed triangles all over the place, and you have to do least squares to sew them all together into a valid mesh. It's not the end of the world, because you can differentiate through the least squares, but it's an extra step. Um, and the scape model had no bones and no joints, which really upset animators, because they expect uh, those things. Um, part lengths weren't maintained when you deformed the, the, the model. And, um, and they did something that wasn't quite right. So they had uh, these deformations of triangles, and they did principal component analysis on those deformations. Those deformations don't live in a Euclidean space, so PCA actually is the wrong thing to do. Here we're doing it in a Euclidean space of, of uh, vertices, pose normalized, so it's actually the right thing to do. You can fix all of that stuff with scape, and uh, we did that, um, but it's just a pain, and this is a lot simpler. And, uh, the other thing, the other big problem with scape is in addition to being the things I've just mentioned, it wasn't compatible with any graphics package. So if you wanted to plug it into Unreal Engine and generate synthetic data, or um, yeah, you, you couldn't do it. It was the right idea, just the wrong, rep wrong representation. Uh, so this is actually really simple. Uh, basically, we create a new body. I take the mean shape, and then I take a bunch of principal components, and I literally um, add them together and you know, multiply and add, and I get a new, new body shape. All right. So, but pose is a little more complicated. So we collected a data set of um, uh, 1,800 bodies in a variety of different poses. And, and then we uh, uh, wanted to learn the pose space. And this is something we call simple. I'll just walk you through this um, and use it to illustrate a few more things. So uh, we have a, some template mesh in the rest pose. This is just 7,000 um, vertices or 21,000 numbers. Uh, we're going to actually optimize the shape of this template. Um, and then there's uh, some uh, these color things here. These are different weights, which I'll talk about in just a minute, uh, basically corresponding to each part and saying how much each vertex is being influenced by each part. And then these white dots are the joint locations. Um, and you'll see that those need to be a function of body shape in just a minute. These are the weights uh, here. So template mesh, joints, and some things called blend weights. We take that PCA space of body shape, uh, and then we, can, we call those shape blend shapes, and we can change the shape of the body. And you notice that the, the joints, the little dots, are moving as the body moves. They're a function of body shape. That's really important to get those right. And then we want uh, to take in a pose, this, art, you know, this kinematic tree we have, and take in this pose theta and repose the body. So we want some function that takes the template, the joints, the blend weights, and the pose of the body and returns vertices. Now the function we're going to choose is, is the dead simplest function that anyone in graphics would choose because we wanted this to be fast and compatible with things. And that's uh, something called linear blend skinning. So, Linear blend skinning, this is what these weights are all about, um, says that every vertex in the mesh, its final position in the world coordinates could be influenced by a bunch of different parts or bones. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, in some weighted combination. And this is a really simple thing to do. It, it reduces some artifacts that you get if you don't do this. It kind of averages or smooths at the um, part boundaries but it also creates all kinds of problems. So the classic problems, if I take a template mesh like this and repose it, I'll get this um, collapse at the joints here. It looks all squashed and it looks kind of weird here in the hip. And so what people do in the graphics community, if I'm, a, my, if I'm making a Spider-Man movie, the director comes in and says, oh, that looks terrible, fix it. Uh, so I go in and sculpt it manually um, the following way. So I add what's called a uh, pose corrective or a blend shape, a pose blend shape. And, and that is I, I go in by hand and I sculpt this mesh to deform it such that when I pose it, it actually looks pretty good. 
Now, now you put this in a new pose, and there's some other problem's going to come up. And I'm going to sculpt that. Uh, and I'm going to do that for uh, lots of different poses every time some problem comes up. And then people use basically um, radial basis functions to try to control when these different correctives are applied. It becomes, for something like Spider-Man, you might have hundreds of these correctives, and you don't really know how they all work together. It's a giant mess. Um, so our, our idea was to learn them. We're going to take examples of uh, bodies, which we pose with linear blend skinning. It's wrong, but we know the truth because we've scanned the person in that pose. And then we can learn a function from the pose of the body to the correctives I should apply. Uh, and that's the basic idea. Um, and here it is in action. So here's a body being posed. And what you're seeing is the template shape of this person uh, deforming as a function of her pose. And hopefully you see things like the elbows and the shoulders and the hips doing all kinds of things. Now this is capturing two things. One, the soft tissue deformation of the body as she moves, and two, the, um, the problems with linear blend skinning. But the final result is uh, uh, nice, works well, and actually turned out to be more accurate than the best scape model that we could build, which I'm confident was the best scape model that had been built. So uh, this really was better than scape. Okay, so the final model then uh, is um, linear blend skinning function W, but now the template of the body is a function of the shaped parameters beta, the pose parameters theta. The pose of the body is a function of the shape parameters. Uh, I've got some mess here. Uh, the weights of the body, and then we're given the, ver the, um, the pose, and then we produce vertices. Very, very simple. Yeah. No, no. So uh, her shape is constant here. So there's a constant shape of the body. And what I'm showing on top of her shape are just the correctives due to pose. So the variations are encoded by the pose variables? Only by the pose variables. And um, so for every individual, they're going to have a defined shape, a single shape. And then, so what we're going to scan, we're going to scan people in a whole bunch of poses. They're going to come up, we're going to create a personalized shape for that person, plus these correctives. It's basically you are showing the subspace of the pose. Yes. Very yeah. And those correctives, in this case, it's, it's a detail, but they're, a, they're actually a linear function of the part rotation matrices. But there's several other ways you can do it. Um, so it's a little technical detail. It's not that relevant. There's another. So when the body, like the arms, goes like this, mm -hmm. right, the, uh, the shape of this part change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's a good point to you. There's, there's no modeling of self-contact here, and so parts can interpenetrate. So, um, uh, and this happens in the training data. So when we fit the model, um, you know, if, if I have very fat legs and they're together, um, uh, they may overlap each other. We ha now have the tools to fix that, and we're uh, building a model of feet at the moment where this, the toes... If you look at your toes, they're probably very close to each other. This is a real problem, um, and so we're, we're hoping to fix that, and then we could apply it elsewhere. Uh, most people try to avoid this when they scan people. You know, they tend to scan people with legs a bit apart, arms in a pose, and, uh, and an A pose. So but when yeah. you say you scan people, you can decompose them into shape and pose. Yeah. When during this de decomposition process, some of these joint problems didn't um, Between uh, two cylinders, did not appear. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, in the beginning, you say you, you have a 40 scan of mm -hmm. people. Yep. And from that, you separate into shape and pose. So, yeah. And then in the middle, you say now it can be shape plus pose. Yes, it is going to be shape. Uh, so the, 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 it's literally going to be um, the following thing. We're going to have a, a template shape. We're going to add uh, the principal components for body shape. This is the PCA space of body shapes. We're going to add that. We're going to then add to that uh, pose correctives for a given pose. These are a function of the pose. So this is an additive model. Uh, and then we're going to rotate the parts. This is the nonlinear part. So all of this is very simple and linear. 
and then we do apply the nonlinearity of the pose. Yeah. The parts are defined by the pose. The, angle. the parts are defined a priori. So actually, uh, we define the parts a priori, but this weight, this weighting function of how they influence each vertex is learned. We have actually worked on learn, learning the parts as well, but um, it's not super necessary. Um, uh, that's complicated. Um, so uh, the, the point is the body is, um, is quite deformable, and there's no outside actor acting on the body in any of this. It's just the body on its own. Um, if I were to put on uh, really tight pants, I'm going to bulge over them in some way. If I poke myself in the stomach, I'm going to deform. We have no um, data like that. So what we've done is we've taken data of people jumping around and inferred the body fat underneath. So inferred the physical properties and the depth of the fat. And then we can apply physics-based techniques. So I could now poke a stomach and get something that looks reasonable. I'm not going to talk about that today. Yeah, um, yeah, and just ethically, we don't poke graduate students in the lab, so you know it would be hard to get the data of like what does it look like when you poke somebody. Um, uh, but um, so anyway, with this model, you now have the ability to control body shape independently from pose, and so we can have multiple different kinds of people um, all doing the same poses. So, any more questions on the? representation and everything. So why do we do this? Well, uh, we wanted to estimate people in images. So what, um, one of the first things we did was people in images plus depth, because uh, that works particularly well. And this is a classical optimization problem. Uh, what you see here is a, uh, the image from an RGBD sensor. This is a connect sensor. Um, you can see that the person is cut off quite often from the field of view. This is the, by the way, the, the stick figure that Connect estimates, which we don't use. I'm just putting it here for reference so you can kind of see what Connect thinks the pose is here. Uh, and then this is our estimate of the body shape and the texture of this person. Uh, it starts out as a coarse blue body and then turns into a high resolution shape that we, um, turns out to be accurate to within 2.4 millimeters of a high quality um, 3D range scan. Uh, and we're able to track people doing quite extreme motions. Um, here the body shape is estimated independently for this same person across all these sequences, and then we, we estimated his body shape, and it's, it's always uh, very close to the ground truth. And could do this for all kinds of people. But you could get quite detailed scans from an RGBD, quite detailed fits from an RGBD sensor. Uh, this is slow. It's super accurate, works really well, but it, it's quite slow. But um, RGBD is useful for lots of things, and um, uh, one of the other things we've done with it uh, more recently is track infants. So here we didn't have a, an infinite body model, and we can't bring them into our scanner and have them stand there and do poses. Um, so what we actually did was take RGBD data and learn the shape model directly from that. We took all the pose correctives from the adult, and we just learned a shape space for the infants. And infants have a very different body shape than adults. Their heads are much bigger and so on. Um, so it's not perfect, uh, but it's, um, we've been using this for the early diagnosis of cerebral palsy, and there's a couple teams around the world that are starting to use this technique in hospital scenarios. So uh, it works relatively well and is super cute, in my opinion. It's the cutest thing we've ever done. Um, uh, but let me come back now to where, where I started. I started saying, look, what I care about are interpersonal interactions, um, people interacting with objects and each other, contact, all of these things are super important. Um, and what I've showed you so far is this uh, simple body model. Now, I'm going to argue that it's a much richer representation than dots. Okay, we can reason about all kinds of things about people with this representation, um, and it's turned out to be quite popular, but it's fundamentally missing something about what it means to be human. And in particular, that concerns me the most, is it's missing our, our facial expressions and our interactions with the world through our hands. And so we need something else. And so I'm gonna describe what we did to, we, our latest model is called Simple X or, or Simplex, uh, which stands for Simple Expressive, which includes hands and faces. 
So to build that, we took the same basic idea, but now rather than our 4D full body scanner, we built a 4D head and face scanner, and then we have people doing all kinds of crazy things uh, in there. Um, we captured our own database of um, many thousands of scans of people doing extreme uh, poses and expressions. That's this data set here. Uh, we also took the Caesar data set with had a, almost 4,000 heads, which gives you a wide variety of head shapes. And we took this D3D facts data set and aligned it. We aligned them all with our um, head template and for a total of 33,000 scans. And then we learned uh, basically exactly the same as the simple model. Uh, we, we learned a shape space. So we factored out pose, that is head pose and jaw pose. And so then this is the PCA space of uh, head shapes, head and neck. And then we um, learned a uh, pose deformation space. So as the mouth and the, um, the neck rotates, uh, the, these pose corrected blend shapes are applied. And then we normalized everything so that pose and um, it, so the pose is normalized and then we construct an expression space of you know, like eye and forehead and mouse motions and so on. Okay, so that's just like the simple model but only for faces. And then we can take an input scan, we can fit that to that, and then given a new scan, we can transfer that. And if it's high resolution, we can get um, a high resolution retargeting. Um. NBC Glad, why? Fox TV jerks quiz PM. So um, that's the kind of, so the model is um, a little low resolution as you see, uh, but it does a relatively good job of capturing. I'll just show you again, see if it works. NBC Glad. Why? Fox TV jerks quiz PM. All right. We did the same thing for hands. We scanned a couple thousand hands of, uh, of 31 subjects in 31 or so poses, including interactions with objects where the objects were painted green so we could remove them easily. Uh, and then we aligned a, a hand model to all of these scan data and we get a whole bunch of um, hand deformations. We could then pose normalize all the hands uh, and when we pose normalize, again, we can compute a PCA space of hand shapes. Here that is. So we've got a bunch of different hand deformations, you see varying finger lengths and so on. Uh, and then we learned a um, pose dependent blend shapes. I'm not going to go into the details of how we did this. Um, uh, this looks a little weird, but it's not the final model. Um, but uh, then we stuck the head and the body and the hands all together. We realigned all of our data so that we have a consistent model. And, uh, and I'll tell you in a moment how we fit that to, to images. But this simplex model uh, is able to capture, these are scans of people doing various kinds of expressive um, things, uh, using their hands and their faces and so on. Uh, from these things, uh, we can build the, the simplex model. And here it is fit to those scans. And you see, I think, a very natural kind of, um, uh, I'm quite happy with it anyway, capturing some details. Anyway, any questions about simplex and body models? Because I'm about to change gears very dramatically. Okay. Um, so before I tell you how we're going to use simplex, uh, I have to tell you a little bit more of the history of the field of human pose and motion estimation starting in 1997. Because there's an entire another thread to the field that I didn't talk about. And that's the pure ML approach, bottom-up approach, in which we're given a single image, um, we uh, compute some features, and we train a classifier, and it says whether it's a, a person or not. Um, and and this, has, this began really in 97. That's when I thought it, it, it took off. Um, maybe there were some earlier ones. But it was this work from Poggio's group in which they took very simple filters, um, these uh, uh, R wavelets, and they uh, convolved images with them, and then they averaged them, averaged the filter responses on uh, some registered images like this. This is also one of those early examples of using a database of images. Um, and then they computed these templates corresponding to the expected HAR uh, wavelet responses. And with that, uh, they trained um, a support vector machine to classify regions of the image as pedestrian or not pedestrian. Of course, it didn't always work. It found the people in the trees and so on. There's a person. Uh, but this was the, really the first full body person detector. Of course, it doesn't do pose analysis or anything like that. 
but uh, it got followed up by lots of other work. Um, Viola and Jones, who had done the famous work on face detection, used uh, boosting uh, for this problem as well and did better than uh, the Poggio's group. And then uh, hog filter filters were mentioned earlier in the meeting, and they were really developed for this problem. Um, uh, Dalal and Triggs developed these HAR features really for this problem of, of person detection. So this was really, there's a thread of machine learning based approaches, and this included going from images to uh, 3D. So this was some work out of Trevor Darrell's group back at MIT, where they took um, multi-view silhouettes, uh, trained a model, and um, estimated 3D pose. Aliosha did some work during, this is from his PhD thesis. It was also one of the things that um, influenced me because they used optical flow in these little tiny images of people where you don't have a whole lot of detail. Uh, and they used the, the flow as a feature to index into a database. Okay, so this is kind of crude machine learning. It's, it's looking up in a database for similar kinds of patterns. But then they could retrieve things like uh, the 2D joints from previously labeled images of similar things. And of course, the flow made it invariant to all kinds of image stuff, which was a, a nice thing. And if they had pre-stored mocap data for 2D joints as well, then they could also use a lookup to get that. So it's kind of um, machine learning done without any of the fancy uh, machine learning. And then the big change came with the Kinect. Uh, Microsoft, uh, and this, this relates to Alyosha's work in the, in the sense that appearance, modeling appearance was really hard. And so he looked at optical flow. What the Kinect folks looked at was range data. So one of the reasons they did this is they could generate a lot of synthetic range data very easily. You take a 3D model of the body, you, you have a sensor noise model, you pose the body, and you get um, depth along with part segmentations. Generating realistic looking people that would look enough like a kid in their home, that was too hard to do. But depth data they could do. And so they were able to train a, a detector, which would find uh, from a depth, depth images like this, find the parts. And from the parts, then they could figure out the joints. Um, so this was a pure bottom-up approach um, based on um, uh, the machine learning of the day, which was random forest, uh, to do part localization, find the joints, and then that was their kinematic tree. That was super influential, um, pre-deep learning, but using synthetic data, machine learning, and a part-based approach. And then a lot of things happened. Mechanical Turk, Amazon introduced it in 2005. Um, the deep learning stuff hit uh, computer vision in 2012. Uh, data sets for human pose began to be um, annotated in around 2012 to 2014. So basically, at the, in this time period, you had a lot of people uh, collecting a lot of images and clicking on a lot of points in Mechanical Turk. Uh, so the MPII human pose data set was uh, 2014. It was hugely influential. And really, this paper by um, Bregler and colleagues uh, from NYU was the first paper I know of that uh, really used deep learning to detect uh, human pose. It's just upper body pose, but they were able to reliably detect um, uh, body parts and joints in a way that nobody had been able to do until this point. It was really a turning point for the, the whole field. And then uh, already in, in 2016, the work that CU was involved in with Deep Cut uh, came out, and, and there was no going back. And today, you know, roughly the state of the art is things like Open Pose from CMU, uh, which works on multiple people, highly robust, as we've already seen from McKenzie's uh, talk. All right. So there. The whole history wasn't useful. We're done. Uh, well, not really, um, because we're still interested in 3D pose of the body and a whole lot more. And this, things like MPI-I have lots of variation. This is super, but only these 2D annotations, whereas data sets like Human EVA and Human 3.6M have 3D annotations, but very limited um, variety. So to get to 3D, there's several ways you can go. You can create synthetic data sets, and we've worked on that. I won't talk about it. Uh, you can, number three, create real data sets with 3D ground truth. Those are really hard to do. We've worked on that, and I won't talk about it. Or you can try to go and learn something about 3D from 2D data only, which I'll now uh, walk you through in my remaining time. 
So we have now all of the history we need. Uh, here's the present. So we're given an image like this. Our goal is to estimate the 3D pose and shape of the body, including the pose of the hands and the face, and it should be pretty good. Never trust anybody who just shows you this picture. Uh, this picture always looks good. Um, only trust 3D if they do two things, show it to you from another point of view, and show you the 3D mesh. Stick figures look great all the time also. And you can see that, oops, we, we haven't quite got this guy's knee right. His knee is forward, it's not forward here. So um, it's not a perfect result. So let's just do this. We want to go from pixels to 3D parameters of, a, of an articulated body and the shape. Uh, so let's just learn a, uh, you know, let's just learn this mapping. The problem is we really don't have training data to do this. We don't have 3D data in the wild, and humans are no good at labeling this. There's no way for a human to go in and tell me the 3D joint angles or the shape of this person's body or anything else. And so the first idea is going to go back to what I talked about in the very beginning of, the, of this lecture, which is this bottom-up, top-down approach. We're going to bottom-up to find, find a whole bunch of 2D joints. This is open pose with hands, feet, and faces. These are pretty reliable things. Um, we can get a lot of training data for this. Convolutional neural networks are good at this. And, and then we're going to fit top down our 3D body model uh, to these detections. Okay? And that's actually going to work relatively well. So why is that easy to do? Well, remember this mesh I defined for you. Uh, this is just a simple body model parameterized by, or the simplex model in either case, parameterized by, by shape and pose. And remember, if I know the 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 shape of the body, I know where the joints are in the canonical pose, and if I know the pose of the body, I can repose all these joints. That's just showing the, the joint locations here. And if I know the camera, then I can project them into an image. So now I can define a loss function, which um, takes in an input, uh, 2D joints from some input image, and I'm going to optimize over the camera parameters. It could be perspective or weak perspective. Uh, and then I'm going to optimize over the pose and shape of the body such that these blue dots project to the same 2D locations as those detected by the detector. And um, you can uh, do it. We're going to do this in two different ways. First, I'm going to do this as a top-down optimization problem in a classical approach. Uh, so this is an objective function, and I'm going to optimize it. And then later you'll see this used as a loss function for uh, training a neural network. Okay. So, is this going to work? Arrow. There's, there's no time yet. No time yet. Uh, right now, there's no time. Yes. Um, let's keep it simple or not. Uh, other questions? All right, so it doesn't really work. Um, various bad things happen. Uh, here's why you never trust anyone who shows you the... Um, uh, the result from the viewpoint of the camera. This actually looks like a pretty good fit, but if, you, if I turn it sideways, you see that this person, uh, who happens to be me, was made too tall, and the pose of the body, um, yeah, not a paid actor, but uh, uh, the pose of the body was wrong. Um, so we have to do a bunch of things to regularize this solution. So we have a prior on human shape. This comes from our PCA space that I showed you before. A prior on hand pose, which we learned from all those hand poses I showed you. A prior on facial expression, which comes from that face model I showed you. Uh, then we also uh, find that if we know the gender of a person, we're better at estimating their body shape. That's not that surprising. We have three genders, by the way. We have male, female, and gender neutral. Um, and uh, we're also going to have a prior on 3D body pose. I'll tell you briefly about the training in VAE to do that. And we need to deal with interpenetration, which is something that CU brought up. So the gender classifier is very simple. Um, uh, we take a, uh, a pre-trained ResNet and then we fine-tune it for this task. Um, what we care about is, uh, is uh, not having false negatives. We don't mind saying, so here is, this is male, this is male, uh, this is male. Um, this is these are uncertain. Um, we don't mind some uncertainties because we can always fit our gender-neutral model. We just don't want to make mistakes and misclassify genders. So we want to keep uh, that. Um, percent incorrect, <coughs> relatively small. Um, interestingly, lots of people have ch chained, trained uh, gender detectors based on faces, but we couldn't find anything anywhere in the literature or on the web 
for training it on the whole body, which seems like a little of a surprise. Anyway, it's online, you can use it. it. Turns out that gender matters. If I find the joints of this guy here and then fit a female body model to him, the pose comes out wrong. If I fit our gender neutral model, the pose comes out right and it's a little bit better if you know that he's male and, and fit a male body model to him. So uh, for poses, we've created a very large data set um, that uh, uh, Otmar mentioned uh, earlier called a mass, which is not online yet, but if you need it, let me know. It has 45 hours of mocap data all in this simple body model format. Um, and using that, we trained a, a VAE to um, uh, uh, encode and decode uh, 3D poses of the body. Uh, this gives us a prior on body shapes that's very easy to implement uh, in the objective function. Um, one little uh, detail about that is that the body is represented here in terms of part rotation matrices, and the VAE is trying to predict rotation matrices. Um, rotation matrices uh, live on a manifold, and you want to make sure that the thing that you predict lives on the same manifold. So in the loss function, we add a couple of constraints that the determinant of what's predicted uh, is close to one, and that uh, it's a ortho orthonormal or orthogonal matrix. Um, and, uh, and with that, it produces things close to the manifold, and you can always project back on, um, but you're never very far away. So you can draw samples of body poses from this thing. A no time arrow, just pose at the moment. Uh, but we can still get interpenetrations of the body when doing optimization, like the arm going through the, the chest here. And so we would like to prevent that. So we uh, implemented a fast, uh, differentiable uh, uh, interpenetration detector, which uh, detects how deeply uh, you're interpenetrating and tries to push interpenetrating vertices back out. And um, so here's an example of a pose estimated without that, which is incorrect with a lot of interpenetration shown in red. And then uh, with this uh, interpenetration term, you get a better uh, pose estimate. It doesn't make a huge difference, but it, it helps a little bit. So the only other uh, competing model came out last year um, from CMU. It's this Adam model. And they, uh, uh, they took our simple body model, detuned it. They removed the pose correctus, which really bothered me a little bit. Uh, they stuck some hand model on and stuck a head model on, but didn't retrain it. So it looks a little bit creepy, like the, the neck here and so on. Um, and the elbows are terrible. But uh, they fit this. They had data from 500 cameras in this panoptic studio, including a lot of HD cameras. And they created a 3D point cloud, and they fit this model to it. And those are the results. So we decided to just take the single images and fit uh, to that. And this is the kind of results you get. We use their uh, 2D pose and face feature detections for the face and hands and body. Um, and then with a single image, you actually do surprisingly well. All right. Uh, we run that on images in the wild. When you see a turquoise body, it means that the gender classifier wasn't sure about this person. Um, and so we use the gender neutral model. All the other ones are gendered models. And uh, it captures relatively nice uh, but not perfect hand poses for things like holding this badminton racket and so on, um, and uh, captures some facial expressions. Of course, it fails. And where does it fail? It fails when the 2D pose detector fails. This is a really hard example where this person's leg, um, this back person's leg goes behind here, and the pose detector didn't figure that out. Um, it doesn't know really about occlusion in the world. That's a problem, and some other failures of the 2D pose detector here. Uh, to evaluate this, uh, we created a new data set um, in which we have this. Sorry, the image quality isn't good, but we have a person here in a 4D scanner. Uh, we have 3D scans of that person and very detailed alignments, which we curated carefully to make sure they were very tight. Uh, this gives us basically ground truth 3D shape for these images. And then we, um, we can. Uh, one can fit to these images and then compare with this um, ground truth. So that's available online. There's no time, uh, but we fit uh, per frame. And so here the body shape is changing with each frame, um, and there's no temporal smoothing, and it runs at about 2.4 seconds per frame, so not real time. So that's uh, where we are. So now you might say, well, could we actually make this faster? So uh, let me go back a, a year to uh, last CVPR and work with Anju Kanazawa, David Jacobs, and Jitendra. Um, 
And we asked this question, could we do this efficiently without explicit 3D supervision? So remember, what we have here are images where we can get 2D ground truth labels. We have our simple body model where we know the, the 3D joints and we can always project them into the image and get uh, 2D joint labels, x hat. And we can look at this loss function. This is the loss function I showed you before. And we can ask the question, uh, given an image, can we uh, train a model to predict the camera parameters, the shape, the pose, given only the 2D uh, training data? This would be super, right? Because now I could get tons and tons and tons of training data. Um, and uh, so we tried that. And uh, it uh, did this. Um, so it's very, very smart about minimizing this 2D projection error. So the joints of this monster uh, project really well to the 2D joints in this image, but don't correspond to a valid human body shape or pose. And so the change we made was to, uh, to say, well, look, okay, we don't know the 3D of this person, but we have all of this data for, that I've been talking about that tells us an awful lot about the shapes of the body and the poses of the body and what it can be in. So uh, let this thing predict a, a body shape, and then I'll train a discriminator to uh, tell me whether it's it's a true body or a false body. And so the goal of this thing is now to fit the 2D, uh, the 2D joint locations while producing a body that passes the discriminator. And the discriminator is trying to get better at estimating what it is as a real human. And if you train this thing together, it actually works uh, pretty well. So um, this works when we have absolutely no paired data where we have any uh, 3D corresponding to 2D. But of course, if we have a little bit of that um, paired data, we, uh, it does even better. And so here's just some examples of this uh, working. On the left is the input image. The next image is the, is the fit of the body. Then we're showing it from a couple different viewpoints. And then this is just body parts projected out. I don't know why. Jitendra likes this. I can, I, it, it's not even the simple part segments, but um, makes him happy, so we show it. Um, anyway, it works fairly robustly, even with occlusion. And now this thing runs pretty fast. Uh, if you give me the bounding box of the person, we will give you back the pose in real time. Um, and then here again, arrow no time. Uh, I, there's no temporal model here. This is just running per frame. Um, and you can see it's a bit jerky. Anju has since uh, done work on making this, uh, doing this in time in a bunch of interesting ways, including physics, and it looks really good. Any questions? Sorry, what is real time here? What is real time here? 30 frames a second, conditioned on having a bounding box. So uh, this was actually running at slightly less than real time. Um, Anyway, it uh, works relatively well. So other ways, and we were really interested in this problem of being esti able to estimate 3D shape of a person um, where you don't have 3D uh, ground truth. So rather than ta tackle the whole body here, we decided to work on faces. So this uh, some work that appeared at CVPR, uh, where we want to estimate, uh, directly go from uh, a single image of a person to the 3D face shape of that person, including their expression. And we're not going to have any paired 3D data for the real images, so we're going to ask, can we learn that? And so we do something different than with Ang Anju here. The idea is that um, we're going to have multiple images of some people, so there's three images of me and one image of Shubik, um, and I have the same face shape in all of these dis despite the change in profile, in view, 3D pose, and expression, and maybe glasses. I think I'm missing my glasses here. Um, and Shubik has a different face shape from me. So that's, um, that's all we're going to know. And then we're going to train a network uh, to predict from pixels the 3D flame parameters, our 3D face model. Um, uh, and the constraint that we're going to have is that the shape parameters of this person's face, this person's face, this person's face should all be the same because I know she's the same person and they should be uh, different uh, from this person. And by that I mean that the difference between these shape parameters uh, should be smaller uh, than the difference here up to some um, epsilon, uh, which is written here. So each of these single elements is going to uh, 
um, be a, a network that goes from pixels to a latent space that, uh, and then a very explicit not latent space of shape parameters, uh, expression parameters, uh, pose parameters, and camera parameters. So these blue things are going to vary for each image because the expression, the pose, and the camera can change, but the shape parameters we know are going to be the same. Now to do this, we're going to take uh, 2D features, again computed by open pose. Uh, we create the uh, correspondence between the 3D mesh of our head and, and these features. For things like the tip of the nose, that's obvious. The corners of the mouth, it's kind of obvious. Uh, for these contour features around the side of the face, those slide around, and so we have these dynamic points. Um, so as the head rotates, we know where they correspond to and uh, can compute this 2D error as before. Uh, I won't tell you about the data set. Um, I'll just show you some results. Uh, training this thing, it works relatively well. The faces are low resolution. The expressions are not super detailed, um, but uh, uh, we don't have to, it works quite reliably on different crops. The images don't have to be very carefully cropped, um, and it estimates fairly quickly. Any questions? All right, um, so uh, the one thing I didn't talk about, and we're uh, just about out of time here, is contact. And so maybe I'll, I think this is absolutely critical. Um, bodies are not in isolation in the world. We can't ignore contact. Um, and uh, so we also had a paper at CVPR. Uh, this is um, uh, some work of uh, a couple of students of, of Cordelia and Ivan's. Um, uh, and uh, some folks in, in our group. And the idea was to take a single image like this and estimate simultaneously the 3D pose and shape of the hand and the 3D pose and shape of the object in the hand. This is a really hard problem because when we're interacting with objects, the objects are occluded and our hand is occluded. It makes estimating um, these things hard. So if you just estimate object shape alone, if you train a network to estimate object pose and shape, it gets messed up by the hand. And similarly, a network trained to estimate hand pose and shape gets messed up by the object. Uh, so the idea was to train these two together. So we have a, a, a network that's going to predict the hand parameters of our mono hand model and another one that's going to predict uh, object pose and shape. These are very simple objects, topologically a sphere. Um, and the, we pull these things together uh, by adding something to the, adding two things to the loss function. Uh, so first of all, we're going to penalize interpenetration between the hand and the object. Um, and then we're also going to encourage uh, the tips of the fingers and the palm to be close to the object, um, to actually be in contact with the object when they're close to it. So it's a sort of an attraction term, and this is an interpenetration term. And with these two things, um, uh, this works pretty well. Uh, to train it, Cordelia's group came up with this clever way of taping, taking the Graspit robot planning software um, and putting our hand model in there. And then given a whole bunch of 3D objects, they generated a bunch of random, or not random, they generated many grasps, stable grasps for those objects. And then we created a synthetic training set called Obman, which isn't very realistic but it turns out it's realistic enough to run it on some real images. So here's examples of real images, which never been trained on real images, and the estimated hand pose uh, and shape. And there's a bunch of analysis in the paper about how stable the grasps are and so on, uh, but I'll just refer you to that and wrap up. Um, yeah, I didn't get to expressions and faces, um, and, but I'm almost done. So I wonder if I can just squeeze in um, uh, one more little thing, uh, which is uh, uh, we created a data set. So we're interested in people expressing themselves and communicating with each other. So we need now avatars and body models that have uh, communication abilities and parameters related to those communication abilities. So here's some um, 3D heads that we captured of people doing a, uh, in our 4D scanner, this is our, our model fit to these, these are alignments to those, and uh, so people saying the things. So will never compile. We experience distress and frustration obtaining our degrees. Notice how differently people speak and how they move their mouths. Masquerade parties tax one's imagination. 
trap challenged me, but the quick step vanquished him. She has a very, very uh, interesting way of speaking where she barely opens Don't her mouth. Top priority on getting his bike fixed. The clumsy customer spills some expensive perfume. So we've got lots and lots of data like this now of 3D heads saying all kinds of things. Um, and our goal then is to uh, be able to relate the speech to the 3D motions of the, of the, the parameters of the face. And, and so we train a model uh, that takes in raw speech signals, as well as some information about the identity of the subject. This is kind of like the style. Um, uh, in the end, we would one day like to really be able to separate style and content, so you could have various speaking styles. Right now, those speaking styles really just correspond to individuals. Um, then, uh, uh, I'm not going to go to the details of the network, we can predict the um, uh, deformations of the mesh. So given an input template mesh of someone we've never seen, the speech of somebody we've never seen, maybe in a language we've never seen, we can take our flame model and uh, all, uh, uh, deform this mesh in a way that looks relatively realistic. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Yeah, I, they told me I shouldn't play this in Germany, but I, I still think it looks really good. Uh, so next, uh, there's going to be a lot more. Realistic bodies, hair, face, clothing. I haven't talked about clothing. We've done some work on that. More photorealistic textures, multi-person capture, interaction with the 3D world and other people. We're working on 24-7 capture. Um, really making autonomous agents that have high-level goals that emote and speak and communicate. Uh, I have a lot more things I'd like to tell you about animals and um, other stuff, but uh, I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop here. Thanks.